Net Wealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with Net Wealths. The guests, organization, and Net Wealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through the Net Wealth platforms, and Net Wealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about Net Wealth can be found on our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please seek professional advice before acting. Welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast, brought to you by the Net Wealth Investment Research Team. In this podcast series, we pick the brains of key wealth management professionals to uncover opportunities and challenges for investors on a diverse range of topics. We hope you enjoy their unique perspectives. Welcome to the Net Wealth Investment Podcast Series. My name is Paul O'Connor and I'm the Head of Investment Management and Research. Today we welcome Tim Cook from Russell Investments, who is the Australian Head of Client Strategy, working across the Russell Investments business in Sydney. The Australian-based Russell Investments business is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Russell Investment Group Proprietary Limited, which is also a wholly owned subsidiary of the US-based Russell Investment Group. Having been established by Frank Russell in 1936 as a small brokerage firm in Tacoma, Washington, over time the business expanded into consulting and pioneered multi-manager investing. Worldwide, the Russell Group had approximately $415 billion of funds under management and $3.6 trillion of assets under advice as at September 2020. The Russell Group has associates globally structured across regional business units covering the Americas, Europe, Middle East and Africa and the Asia-Pacific, overlaid by global service lines that include the investment division, consulting and advisory services and investment services. As of 30th of September 2020, the Russell Group employed 1,328 people globally with 241 investment professionals within the investment division. So you'd certainly say Russell are well-resourced technically. Tim works with superannuation and non-superannuation clients in Australia and New Zealand, providing advice on investment policy and strategy, asset allocation, manager selection, portfolio structuring and implementation. He is also the asset consultant to the trustee overseeing the Russell Super Solution Master Trust in Australia and sits on the Russell Global Forecasting Committee which generates the economic scenarios underpinning Russell Investments global strategic modelling. Prior to this, Tim worked in the firm's London office as an Associate Director in Client Strategy and Research. He advised institutional clients in Europe focusing on asset liability modelling, liability hedging strategies and supporting clients' investment strategies. Before joining Russell in 2006, Tim was a manager in Price Waterhouse Coopers investment consulting practice for seven years. Tim has a Bachelor of Science in Geography from the University of Birmingham and is a Fellow of the Institute of Actuaries. There are 11 Russell investment options on the NetWealth Super and IDPS investment menus that cover a range of diversified strategies from conservative through to high growth. These include five managed funds that employ traditional strategic asset allocation with dynamic tilting, two managed funds that target real returns, and four managed accounts or SMAs. Interest in environmental, social and governance, or ESG, investment strategies, has grown significantly over the last three years and is now seeming to become mainstream in investment management. Historically, investment management typically analysed a business or a security using a financial metric and a qualitative overlay of management quality focusing on maximising the financial return. However, ESG involves incorporating non-financial metrics and blending it with traditional financial analysis. In the 1960s and the 1970s, economist Milton Friedman, in direct response to growing interest in philanthropy, argued that social responsibility adversely affects a firm's financial performance and that regulation and interference from big government will damage the macro economy. 
His contention that the valuation of a company or an asset should focus almost exclusively on the bottom line, with the costs incurred by social responsibility being deemed non-essential. And this underwrote the belief really prevalent for most of the 20th century. Towards the end of the century, however, a contrary theory began to gain ground. In 1988, James S. Coleman wrote an article titled Social Capital in the Creation of Human Capital, and this really challenged the dominance of the concept of self-interest in economics and introduced the concept of social capital into the measurement of value. At a high level, investment management ESG analysis involves incorporating environmental issues that focus on sustainability, such as the threat of climate change and depletion of resources, social analysis that focuses on diversity, human rights and consumer protection, and governance that focuses on diversity, management, employee relations and rights and compensation. The growth of ESG product has been extraordinary in recent years and the management of these strategies varies significantly. There are passive ESG strategies that involve, I guess, more a simple negative screen to remove companies or securities in the investment universe of the strategy that do not meet their ESG standards. And there are active ESG strategies that, I guess, include both a negative and a positive screen in the investment management process. The added complexity is that both negative screens and positive screens used by managers differ significantly. So to start with Tim, can you explain how you came to be working in Sydney with Russell as an investment consultant? And um, it appears you've made your way from the UK to uh, to Sydney as your home. Yep, I certainly can. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yeah, so I, as you said, I started my um, actuarial investment consulting training back at PwC, um, but I moved to uh, the London or the Russell London office back in 2006. Um, before I moved there, I was doing a lot of manager research and consulting and really felt that I wanted to move to somewhere where I could really focus on the consulting aspect. And, and Russell obviously had a, it was well known for its uh, manager research. And so that's what attracted me to, to moving in, in London. Um, then I uh, then I effectively did meet an, uh, an Australian, and um, as is often the way, one follows the, uh, the 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 female to their place of residence, and, and ended up moving here in um, in, in 2013. Um, nicely timed for the Lions visit, which I'm um, a big fan of watching. So um, came over here in 2013 with Russell, and um, you know that was that was great to sort of move I- internally. And um, got a lot of time for you know working um, with Russell and, and and thankful for their um, their moves. In fact, I have I've actually um, been employed twice by Russell. Um, went travelling at one point, took a year out, and then came back and, and it slotted straight back into my old role, which is which was nice. Um, but like I said, what I'm I'm here doing is is providing advice to clients, and that's um, my head of client strategy role really sort of transcends the, the retail and, and, and the institutional and, and the master trust business at, at, at Russell Investments. And that's really what I'm, I'm passionate about is helping clients find solutions or, or solve problems. And, um, you know, that's why I came to Russell is so I could focus on that side of the equation um, rather than sort of doing what I did before, which was manage research and, and, and client consultancy. Um, but I really find that that breadth I've got um, across those different areas of the Russell business is is part of what sort of excites me and, and gives you that sort of challenge. And I guess also your interaction with the, the client base as well would give you a really good feel for the feedback and the interest, particularly in ESG. So probably makes you um, uh, very well placed for uh, the podcast with us this morning there, Tim. Um you work across both retail and institutional clients. So what do you see as the main difference in the needs of these clients? Yeah, well, I mean, when we're, we're looking at all clients, uh, we try to understand the sort of goals um, or the preferences of our clients. And then, then you know, as you well know, we put together well-researched, our best-in-breed managers together, put together a portfolio using all of our portfolio construction tools and and give the best possible solution or portfolio to it to a client um, which maximizes 
the chance of them achieving their own objectives. But the objectives and how they define those objectives just change across different across the institutional and, and the advisor market. So within the institutional, it's it's very goal orientated, I would say. Um, they may have a, a complex set of liabilities um, or, or, or a specific funding program that they need to solve for. So you can often be quite mathematical. Um, and that's certainly my background from defined benefit in, in the UK. And you know, I still have my fingers in defined benefit um, calculations out, out of New Zealand as well. Um, but you need a sort of a, a carefully designed portfolio that delivers that return pattern um, that achieves the goals that, that they need or have set out to achieve. Um, you often find uh, in the ESG space that they will have um, not-for-profits or, or charities will have missions or beliefs that are important to them. And that influences that portfolio construction, that influences that funding program that, that they may have. But when you, you move across to the sort of advisor client side of the equation, it's, it's much more I afraid, much more around key preferences. Um, so you, you're not only trying to design a portfolio that, that meets um, a long-term return objective, but um, you need to have things like you know, greater tax efficiencies for clients. You need to take that into account more so than um, necessarily on the institutional side. Um, you need portfolio transparency to the end, end client, and the advisor needs to sort of see um, be able to show their end client all of those underlying stocks, and that's, that's key, especially in the, the managed account world. Um, but they still want that best of um, best investment ideas that that we can bring from from our global research. Um, so you mentioned the, the the managed accounts; they're a good example of um, it's it's not necessarily just a uh, an investment problem that we went about when we were trying to design those. Um, you're trying to um, provide those the efficient tax vehicle. Um, you're trying to give that transparency through the direct Australian uh, equity holdings. Um, and you're trying to have that dynamic core um, that, are, that are in the managed accounts, because that gives the people, um, the advisors and then clients, the actual ability to um, dynamically adjust the portfolio, but without contributing to trading and turnover. And, and that's that's very important when you're on that sort of platform side of it. So it, it, it's really that sort of difference is there's the overall objectives, which you can probably draw some alignment between, um, but it's the implementation and the preferences that you get on, on different sides of the ledger that make it um, make it interesting to uh, solve those two quite distinct solutions or problems, um, which provide you with actually different answers in the end. Interesting your uh, your comments there about the retail market and uh, retail clients having a, um, a, a an interest in transparency in the portfolio, and I guess that's what our experience at NetWealth has been in terms of the the growth of interest in the managed account service. And I find that the whole managed account trend, a lot of that is driven by that actual transparency, where the investor can actually see the underlying uh, allocations, they can see the I guess, changes to the asset allocation and the management over time. So it's really bringing a, a product, making it a lot more tangible, I think, to uh, to the retail market there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. 100%. Yeah. It, like, sorry, it's a, it, you know, the, the, the tangibility brings in, you know, you've got to be able to see it, feel it. Um, you know, and, and each advisor uh, group or, or advisor has a has a different sort of, maybe maybe they have a different cost point, but... What they also have um, is, as long as the, what we just discussed there, is they'll have their own philosophy. And it's very important to try and, or it's, we view it as very important to try and build that into any solution or advice that we're providing. So what is that advisor's um, desire around or, or, or views around the risk controlled nature of their portfolio? Um, is, it, is it about active management? Is it about downside protection? Are they looking for sort of geared equity exposures? What is their philosophy uh, or what is their combined in client philosophies in, in terms of how to build that up um, and that's um, where it comes in and, and also what makes it then interesting is how the the ESG component comes into you know, thinking about the solutions that mm. the end clients want and, and and try not to necessarily sort of break those um, return objectives and that that is that is one bit that is consistent across the institutional and the retail world it's it's how do I how do I step into ESG, the ESG landscape, um, but not withstanding my my you know, goals and objectives or preferences that I've already set up. 
Yeah, need to generate a return and what impact will that have yep. on the probability of yeah, meeting that objective, I guess. Yep. So responsible investing is a growing global trend. And as a global manager, how are you seeing these trends play out in different markets and different clients? And I guess, uh, is the Australian experience being replicated across Europe and the US and the broader Asia? Yeah, no, um, it's a it's a good question. We you so say we are um, a, a global firm and we have um, global committees very actively working in in this area to to provide um, to react to provide solutions to research and, and understand the impacts a, a, across the globe. And you know we know that different regions are doing things at different speeds. Um, I was speaking to our local representative on our, our global um, responsible investing committee just this morning, um, and he was referring to things um, in, in Europe. So obviously we know that the, the Paris Agreement and Article 8 and all those sort of impacts that are, that are hitting Europe uh, mean that there is a, a big increase in the adoption of responsible investing in, in Europe. Um, funds, I think one of the stats that I've seen is that over a third of the assets now are classified as having ESG uh, characteristics over there because they now have to declare if they have them. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a huge number and so wow. lots, of funds yeah. are, lots of funds are now having to sort of back that up as well in terms of making sure that they are um, uh, meeting those ESG um, characteristics or, or promises um, and you're also seeing mainstream funds needing to start dropping their carbon footprint and um, so it's not just ESG specific but it's now just ma it's coming into the mainstream more um, the, the the US I would say is probably a little bit further behind um, both um, Australia and uh, Europe uh, the drive over there is far more uh, it comes far more from specific client mandates or, or specific requirements um, that are put or that are brought to bear by the, the end client or end user, um, as opposed to a sort of more top down shift. Um, I've certainly, like in, in Australia, um, it's at it's at the the, the forefront as well. Um, we um, within Russell are, um, you know, nip and tuck with with that of Europe in terms of. Um, innovation in terms of the, the, the products or solutions, the, the, the research to clients and the, the interest level. And then, you know, they go hand in hand um, in, in reality. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the stats we've got is that the, the ESG funds in, in, in retail um, is up to sort of 33 billion as of June this year, which is, you know, a material increase in just, just 12 months. Um, I think it's like a 66% increase. Obviously, the markets have jumped in that time as well. So that's not all client flow, but it it's still material um, flows into in the ESG funds. And certainly, when I look at the um, when I look at the managed account space and I look at the um, the platform um, availability of ESG orientated solutions, it's quite exciting to see the amount of options that are coming onto platform. Um, and that sort of the, the the depth that we're now seeing there. If I would have looked at it 12 months ago, I would have said there's solutions in in Australia on platforms. There, there wasn't a lot of depth, um, but now we're seeing sort of the those those products and those solutions and that, that thinking become more mainstream, become more available, and you know match up with the sort of research that we're doing globally in terms of seeing oh this this manager is great. Um, you know, 12 months ago, they weren't available in Australia. Now they're now they're available in Australia. So you know, that's really exciting to see. Um, it really helps us or myself when I'm thinking about trying to build something, um, building something that's as, as as good as it can get. Yeah, I would. I, I'd hazard a guess, but I would feel we'd get two or three approaches a week from managers about adding ESG strategies onto the investment menu for our uh, for our clients, and that'd be far greater than any other type of strategy there um, that we wow, offer yeah. um, on the extensive investment menu there. But um, is there any sort of bent towards environment, social or governance trends that you're seeing in different markets. And I guess what I'm getting at there is that my observation in Australia is that in ESG, most of the retail focus is on environment. There mm -hmm. is some on social. Governance, not so much. Governance appears to be more at the regulatory level or an ASX mm -hmm. listing rule. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but have you, have you got any, any insights there as to the different 
in the E and the S and the G, what the bent is across different markets, or yeah. are we pretty in, in line with um, the globe? No, I think I think I think the the growth in E um, is is in line with what's going on certainly in Europe, as I just just mentioned, and that's where all the focus is is growing. I would sort of flip it in in, in my mind in terms of like the G is. The G's always been there from an active management stance. Um, we, uh, you know, about to release our um, uh, ESG survey in, in the coming, I think it's maybe next week or so. Um, but we were rank, or not rank, but we survey managers to understand what their focus is and, and how that um, changes through time, um, having done it on a, a, over an, a period of time. And it used to be just governance. I mean, it kind of stands to reason that an active manager um, we'll want to go in and, and well, certainly a, a qualitative active manager will go in and speak with a um, corporate and understand their processes and think about the governance that they are operating under as to whether that's a good investment opportunity. And that certainly used to dominate it. So uh, the stats are something like, you know, the, the key decision was was governance and that was 91% back in 2018. And as you say, um, it, the E side of it has grown dramatically. So we're now seeing that, um, you know, 15% of what they think most impacts the stock is coming from um, sort of the environmental side of the equation. Um, but that that core of governance is still there. So I think that that to us as a, an active manager or a selector of active managers has always been something that should have been uh, and was embedded within how you assess a stock and whether you think that stock has has um potential to out or underperform um and we we you know every time there is a governance blow up or hiccup in any firm you you see that and you see that in in quite a stark um impact on the on the share price quite often um whereas the environmental side of it we know that's going to be a longer term trend um and it may not be a it's not an overnight thing something's not going to break um or it's unlikely to break overnight and hit the share price the next day. Uh, a, a governance hiccup um, for, for not wanting to downplay it, but where those sort of things go wrong, you see the share price impact almost immediately. And, and that's why active managers are always looking for those and, and seeing certain stocks as more risky than others. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, I guess, the comment you've made that governance, I guess, really has always been part of the the investment management, I guess, uh, particularly active investment management mm. in looking at the quality of a corporate or even from my perspective, at looking at the quality of a fund manager. Um, so yes. whereas the E and the S are a little bit more, I guess, to do with the trends and changing views of society and how we treat the environment and how we respect others, et cetera, there. So... Um, Russell's known as a global leader in multi-asset portfolios, and as I mentioned earlier, you really were one of the pioneers or the pioneer um, in multi-manager investing, and but also in manager research. So, how does the ESG play a role in your investment process? Um, well, we, we've got a sort of a fundamental belief that you know, investing responsibly uh, will deliver attractive investment returns over time and, and, and meet clients' objectives. Um, it's it's kind of a, I don't want to be um, too glib on it, but it's almost a, a, a no-brainer that we um, recognise that these factors, whether they are E, S or G, and we've just gone through G in, in, in a bit of detail and, and, and E we understand in terms of um, the, the green transition and and, and 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 the like and the carbon footprint reduction over time, um, but there will be or is highly likely to be a an impact on on share price and impact on returns, and you know whether that is a trend through time or or a hiccup or or a sudden sudden impact, uh, we believe that it does impact um, share prices, and therefore if we are out there selecting an investment manager and we think they're good at their job, they too must believe that and be able to actually demonstrate um, that they, they do that. So it's, it's, it's long been embedded in our, our research of fund managers as to um, what are you doing on um, ESG? What, do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts? What's your philosophy? How much you know, time do you spend on it? Can you illustrate how you've 
um, incorporated that into stock selection or portfolio construction in the funds that we're, we're considering. Um, so that's that's one of the ways in which it plays a, plays a key role in our in our whole process because it's embedded within our um, manager research. Um, but then it goes almost further than that now into the um, the realms of well that's a sort of as, a, as integration and then you've got um, actually sort of designing solutions that meet specific goals or, or needs. And we understand that like, no one size fits all. So we've already discussed three different regions uh, around the world and each the, the demand and the shift and the regulatory um, environment is different in each one of those areas. So you can't just have a single solution that, that meets everyone's need. You don't even get that when you're in one particular region, um, especially when you start moving into the sort of um, the missions and the beliefs of um, certain investors, uh, whether that's a, a charity or, or, an, or an individual. Um, if someone is bringing strong beliefs um, to the the table, then you know there's a different solution that's sort of arguably arguably needed there. Um, so I just sort of I, it really is. ESG is uh, factors are it's a core belief of ours that they impact security prices. So we're not creating a sort of niche area that we're we're, we're not suddenly staffing up a um, an ESG team and saying, oh, this is a cool growth area. We'll just staff that up now. Um, we actually believe it impacts all of our business as it stands, and so it is. It has been important. It's important. It will continue to be important. Um, and it's our critical area in which we actually sort of um, rank our, our investment managers. Given the, I guess, you know, the earlier comments I'd made about the growth of ESG and mm-hmm. acceptance amongst the retail market, and I guess ESG criteria becoming commonly accepted now, such as climate change and social responsibility that we've already mentioned, but mm-hmm. how does Russell consider ethics to be part of ESG analysis? And I guess ethics, in my mind, are something that are a lot more complex because I find that ESG, most people can can agree to varying degrees on climate change and what action we need to take as a planet, etc. Whereas ethics can be very different, pending the the background of the individual, their ethnicity, their religious beliefs, etc. So, do you consider ethics as part of ESG? I mean, it, I mean, you can probably come into it fits into all three of them. I would, you know, you you could you could argue, um, in terms of the the, the backdrop to where you come up with your beliefs and and the the ethics around that. Um, it, it certainly comes into um the governance side of it, and a lot of the blips that I mentioned earlier are sort of ethical. Um, uh, what's the right phrase? Um, where ethics maybe weren't front and center during certain decisions. So that's that, that makes that very uh, important with across the, the governance side of the equation. And and also um, in the, the the S side of it, it it's certainly part of that. Um, you know, modern slavery is one of the things that there's a lot of focus on now, and, and that certainly plays into to that arena. So we are out there um, researching our, um, you know, the market in general, but, you know, certainly with, investment managers to understand how they are thinking about these things, how they are incorporating that into their own process and how they are actually then implementing it into in their, their, their stock picks and their portfolios that they put together. Um, because if there is a material breach of ethics by a particular firm, um, then that's going to impact the share price of that firm. Um, so when we're just generally being asked to manage money on behalf of clients and um, we need to protect against that sort of um, uh, impact whether it's a, an ethical stance or not um, so it, it, it's definitely in how we pick portfolio managers and how we hope those portfolio managers are managing managing the stocks and being aware of um, I don't know, maybe the culture of a firm and whether that's going to be positive or negative. And, and certainly we would expect our managers to all things being equal, um, which obviously it never is. But if all things are equal, then you, you, you are on the side of the firm with a better cultural um, standpoint and, and, and can evidence that as opposed to someone, a firm that's known for, for having less than perfect ethics, so to speak. Before we bring you the second part of this chat, a little bit about who we are. 
NetWealth is an ASX-listed company established to help Australians take control of their financial futures. With a wide range of super and investment accounts, a huge variety of investment options and market-leading online tools, we can help you manage your wealth your way. Partner with us to see wealth differently and discover a brighter future. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS, which you should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Hmm. Yeah, it's sort of interesting. I guess a common theme in talking through the way you're incorporating ESG and even, even ethics as part of the ESG analysis is that it is having a material impact on the pricing or valuation of an asset now. So <laughs> it would be... I guess, remiss of a, of a manager in this day and age not to be incorporating or thinking about how to further incorporate and develop ESG into their investment process because um, it will go hand in hand with, uh, with uh, generating the return that the clients need. Um, so interesting, interesting comments you make there, Tim. Um, so Russell has both ESG integrated and ESG managed solutions. What's the difference? Um, I mean, this sort of really sort of tries to draw out what we were, what we were just talking about here in terms of um, one is a it should be incorporated across the board and integrated everywhere. Um, it should be the, at the core of, of how we do business. And then the second sort of moves into um, people with people or clients or, or sectors or regulators with specific needs and and um, uh, solutions that are required for that uh, that arena. So, given that we believe that responsible investing is is it effectively intelligent investing, uh, for not wanting to sound like it's a strap line, um, it we need to integrate our ESG considerations into into our research, into our portfolio management, and also into active ownership, which which um, is also a very key area um, where we think that that adds that adds value but if i spend a bit of time on the integration um, and a bit more on how we research our managers what we are looking to do in terms of that integration into our process is to assess those portfolio managers on their um, or on our esg criteria so we expect them to have um, an ESG commitment. We like we expect them to incorporate um, and undertake ESG considerations. So thinking about uh, commitment, they're, they're showing value and money and, and staffing and resource pay, put paid to it. Um, they are um, considering the impacts on stocks and, and portfolios and and regions and markets and sectors, etc. Um, but then they're also implementing it. So it's all well and good to sort of have nice shiny presentations, but if you're not if you can't demonstrate that in your portfolio and stock selection then or portfolio construction and stock selection then it's all just sort of window dressing and so we that's why we have it all split out across three different areas and then the fourth own area is that active ownership area um, which which is key we think that you can actually sort of achieve a lot of good and in terms of good for let's say the environment but also good for the share price um, uh, through sort of active ownership and, and having a good approach there um, that ESG rank that we provide builds into our overall rank and then builds into the portfolios. So, um, you know, all things being equal, a manager that has a better ESG aggregated rank um, has a better chance of outperforming and therefore will, will, will undertake a larger role within our portfolios or, or better ESG uh, managers will be across more of the portfolios to actually provide that um, level of um, protection, you could say, or, or, or alpha generation, because it's the same, the same sides of the, uh, two sides of the same coin sorry um so that's um that's how we do it in the in integration um and you know we've got our own sustainable risk policies and practices that mean that we need to um think about things from a portfolio construction point of view sort of do undertake the risk analysis on that and that's really where we we're integrating again it's that are we taking the right risks? Are we having? Do we have too much risk? How are we putting these portfolios together? So that's all the integration, and that's how we would do it across the board anyway. Before we then move into what is a um, an ESG managed solution. So these are solutions that have specific targets or specific um, objectives that are to gotcha. undertake or something client that is driven, client or, client or market true. driven. Yeah, client yeah. or market. Yeah. 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 So I mean, it it it's things like um, a certain percentage reduction in the carbon footprint, 
So it, it, is, it is not just um, pick the right managers. Um, it's then also target something that is demonstrable and you can then say, yes, the, this portfolio has a carbon footprint um, and you know, we have one that is 50% of the market. So by investing in that product, you can achieve the, it's tracking error is supposed to be very tight to the benchmark, but you can achieve a lower um, carbon footprint. So that's that's one of them. Um, or we, um, you know, need can have strategies that need to have a, an ESG score that is X percent above the market or other um, solutions whereby they exclude certain things. So they may exclude alcohol and gambling. Um, and again, that's again, a, a target market or a um, key core sort of um, desire from from individuals or, or institutions alike. Um, and one of the things that we you need to do with those sort of solutions is to ensure that they're um, they are in line with the, the client and the market expectations for those solutions. So um, we are an active member of the Responsible Investments Association Australia, um, and it's important to us to be recognised um, again by RIA um, as a responsible investing leader and to have that on the funds that do set out there as having a uh, as having a ESG managed solution. Um, so you got you got to there's importance in both sides of it. One integration across the whole piece, and then there's ESG managed solutions are specific answers to specific problems, if you like. It was interesting just reflecting earlier on your comments around ESG integrated and active ownership. And I guess my thought is that active ownership is really, I guess, the outcome of the investment strategy and the impact that it can then have on capital and influencing companies to change behaviours, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very much a key area there, I think. And it's certainly an area of discussion that I have with many fund managers that are offering ASG strategies, and particularly, obviously, the equity strategies and the, the credit managers, et cetera, about, um, about how they actually interact and try and change, you know, make behavioural change amongst the corporates there. So mm. really key, really key points you made there, Tim. Um, there's an increasing focus, I guess, on greenwashing and you hear <laughs> this term bandied around like uh, regularly now. And I mean, ultimately, I guess it's, it's referring to the fact that, you know, people trying to dress up strategies or companies trying to to show that they adhere to certain ESG principles and standards. But what's your take on this? I, yes, I mean, the, with greater demand for a, a solution or a product comes greater sort of, I don't know, concern, well, in this instance, concerns about greenwashing. So people coming to market or um, firms coming to market themselves and, and, and not necessarily being 100% clear on, on what they're saying. Um, and, and it is generally used in this instance as overstating a product's credentials um, or misleading investors on how environmentally sound or ethical a fund really is. So to us, it's, it is important to, um, if you're moving from the integrated side to the managed ESG managed solution sort of side, um, that you need to be very, very clear on exactly what Sorry, let me let me step back. Clients need to be very clear on what they're seeking in, in, in a product. Does it have positive tilts? Does it have um, negative screens? Um, and it's through understanding what the end portfolio is doing, and 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 obviously it needs to be clearly defined what it's doing. Um, you understand whether you are um, holding something that you actually want to hold, and and it meets or matches your own objectives or preferences or, or, or mission statement or, or, or beliefs. Um, we um, believe it's important to make um, clear um, objectives, clear sort of statements around what's going on in our funds so that it is it is completely evident that this is what we are seeking to achieve and this is how we're achieving it, um, as opposed to necessarily saying, oh, it's a green fund, but we're not really going to tell you what it's all about because that's not – that is where you get that that greenwashing issue. Um, we're very clear on ours, what we're trying to achieve. If there is exclusions, these are the stocks that are excluded. If there is a um, a target um, reduction in carbon, then this is the target reduction in carbon. Um, and we are um, doing that by you know, picking stocks with a lower carbon footprint. That's not excluding 
particular stocks because you may not want to exclude particular stocks. Um, so that's you know one of the things we're very clear on in in the lower carbon um, solutions. Um, but equally, if you have an an X something solution, you need to be very clear on how you're defining that X. So is it X any interaction or is it X 10% of its um, revenue from a certain source? Um, and, and that's where you, you often get that problem in terms of, you know, you X alcohol or X gambling. It's like, what about this? Where's the line drawn in the sand? And, and it's really important just to be very clear on that line in the sand and for investors then to uh, consider that where that line is and, and make sure it ali aligns, I can sorry too many lines, but aligns with their own desires for what they're looking to achieve yeah i think that's very important from the manager's perspective being able to articulate the esg strategy and i i found some i guess you know people that have accused a manager of a security of greenwashing it may actually come down to difference in views and opinions on esg and the areas that make up esg and i think to myself as a good example there being that you know a, a client may not want any exposure to old energy and mm -hmm. but then where do they sit in the view of nuclear energy and what role should nuclear energy be playing in trying to assist the, the whole planet to transition to clean energy and how long that will take. So the, the complexity of the, of the issues, um, I tend to find the more you peel them back and get into the issues, the more complex they become. Um, so it gets back to that important point about the manager very being very clear in how they articulate their um, their strategy there. So, and I guess moving on to that, how are exclusions managed across Russell Investments, various um, products and um, and funds and SMAs that you have available? Yep. So, uh, I mean, again, within the ESG. Um, sphere there is effectively or how i think about it and i try to explain it is that you've got exclusions and you've got active ownership and if you're excluding you can't be at you know and ent ent entertaining um active ownership or proxy voting so we actually have a, have a belief that active ownership is one of the best portfolio actions that you can actually undertake to generate meaningful change um we undertake that through proxy voting processes um, and you we publish reports on on websites on on that each year in terms of all the different votes that we undertook and um all the different engagements and where we voted against um, um the corporate and where we voted against um our, our advisors or, or all those sort of things in terms of how we're looking to, to to make a change there um and then there's engagements with themes around environmental stewardship um or, or climate risk reporting you know making sure that the, the companies are undertaking those um you know we will we will vote in line or vote against um certain director appointments um and that will bring about people to the boards of certain companies and uh, there's some very recent press on sort of Exxon Mobil um, uh, directors being appointed to that board um, where you know the engine number one was the people who were putting up the the um, dissident sort of uh, board members and these people were were voted in to provide that sort of a different or an alternative viewpoint and I think that was direct proxy voting or direct um, active ownership that actually provides that um, that, that benefit um, or, or action. Um, whereas if you're excluding, then then you can't necessarily undertake that. Um, the other thing that we, we we seek to do by actually owning a lot of the, the shares is you know, collaborate with other in, investors and and organisations like the Climate Action 100, um, and in, like, that's an investment investor-led initiative, um, trying to in, in, in ensure that the greenhouse emitters are taking the necessary steps on, on climate change. So it's using a collective investment weight to to enact change um but exclusions that's not to say that exclusions don't have a role they definitely have a role to play um and they they where that comes in again is on that specific needs and, and preferences that we just spoke about in, in in greenwashing in terms of people have views and you know one person's view is not the same as another person's view and one person may want to exclude anything that's like ever um ever mind coal versus something that only makes um, 
10% of its revenue from coal. Or the same goes for um, alcohol or, or gambling. Where do, where do you draw the line? One person may think that, yes, it, excluding um, uh, sole gambling orientated stocks is where I want to draw the line. Others may think, no, no, there are there are corporates out there who bring in 30, 40 percent of their money from uh, gambling and, and they should be excluded, too. And, and where do you draw that line? Um, and, and that's where the negative screens do come in. And they come in around fossil fuels. Typically, they come in around alcohol and they're coming around gambling. And, and this is where we're, we're moving through that, that ES and uh, e and S there, those sides of the equation. And that's where you get a lot of those exclusions coming in. Mm. Yeah, no, very interesting there. So maybe just in the interest of time there, Tim, mm -hmm. where do you see ESG evolving over the last, or over the next five years and longer? Yeah. I mean, that's where uh, I just sort of start off with saying I'm moving into a personal opinion territory here. Um, but <laughs> you know, my... Um, my view is that you know it's long, so far it's been the um, the home of of equities. So the equity solutions that have been provided to the market are plentiful. Um, we're still getting more coming to market, um, but I think what we're starting to see is more. No, no, I don't think we, I know we're getting more coming to market in terms of fixed income, in terms of real assets and, and alternative assets having an ESG slant to their management or their the solutions coming to market. So I'm imagining those are the people knocking on your door to, to get on platform. And that, you know, to me, that makes it quite exciting in terms of building solutions because I can, we can, we, we can bring to market a, an ESG orientated managed account or, or, or managed um, solution because you've got the, the depth of research, you've got the depth of product and you've got the depth of solution across the entire um the entire uh, suite of assets that you need to build a, a portfolio. Typically, it was just someone would have a, a an equity um, uh, exclusions and, and they wouldn't be thinking about it in terms of fixed income or they wouldn't be thinking about it in terms of um, uh, listed infrastructure, which, you know, we're, we're seeing those products come to market where um, we don't have to just select a product that has a very good ESG ranking from our own perspective. The manager is very good at considering ESG, um, but now they're 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 bringing out specific infrastructure ESG funds, and you know we can build those into uh, multi-asset ESG solutions. So that's quite exciting to sort of see that. Um, the other things areas in in different markets, um, I definitely think that more clients are going to get. Um, um, involved um it's going to be more important to almost everyone in um almost every all of my clients will be will be uh concerned and uh, very much more involved as opposed to something it's something we'll deal with next next quarter or whatever it is um it'll be interesting one of the things i think is kind of quite interesting is how your future your super um impacts um you know sort of esg within australia um those benchmarks that that all superannuation funds are having to deal with might put a pause on ESG evolution there, or not evolution, but the weight of money to ESG solutions um, because they have to be conscious of that benchmark. So um, you're going to see a lot of, yeah. 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 So what you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have, if people, unless it's going to stop in superannuation, and that's probably not what APRA would be hoping for, um, then you're going to have products that have the, how can I get a, an ESG tilt, but without, demonstrable risk to the benchmark and how do I minimize that because no one's going to be excluding 20% of the benchmark anymore within in super because it's, it's too risky um, the other areas it really is is how investment managers bring it bring it in to play um, the pace of we're really seeing it in all our research the pace at which managers are bringing in much more importance to, to ESG um, across their you know their research and their commitment and their um, you know, portfolio construction is growing. And it's how does that change through time? Um, how does it move from, you know, getting into corporates and it becoming more prevalent in corporates? Um, I definitely think that it is a, um, we're on a cruise liner, it's it's moving. Um, and uh, the direction is, is, is picking up speed and it's not going to suddenly, you can't just slow it down. It's not going to slow. And I definitely think it's going to, it's going to keep moving. Um, the other questions that really sort of come to mind is how does a traditional portfolio and an ESG um, specific portfolio, how do they look in, in years to come? So you've got to think about 
what's going on in Europe, whereby the traditional portfolios have to have a 20% carbon footprint reduction. So if they're going to have to do something akin to that, what does a, an ESG managed solution look like? Um, and you're going to get this sort of different step pace of what's happening in the market generally, and then what's happening in the, in the ESG orientated solutions. So I think that's going to be a an interesting dynamic. Um, and the, the, the final thoughts I've got on it is just around the active management um, side of it. We we know the E is, is growing in pace. We know it's in, it growing in importance and the the uh, effort to reduce carbon footprint and reduce emissions is, is, is ongoing and, and that will have an impact on share prices, positive or negative. Things are changing. BHP used to be one of the stocks that would get beaten up on this area. And they're now one of the largest um, people funding green um, or renewable energy uh, research. So, you know, once a stock that was bad is now a stock that's arguably good in the area. So, you know, you, you need an active manager to, or, or my belief is probably you need an active manager to be taking those views on a day on day basis. Because if you excluded them back in the day, you, it, you know, or if you exclude a stock, let's move away from a particular stock, you exclude a stock because of X, um, that may or may not be beneficial to you. But if that stock turns itself around, you may be underperforming based on that exclusion. And it's how do you build that in and that's why I think that active management in ESG still has a long way to to run um, in, in this area and add alpha for yeah, clients. Yeah. I, I, I think I yeah well I'd fully agree with you on that comment there Tim where I, I believe that ESG investing it can't just be about a negative screen a passive negative screen. It's got to involve positive screening and also engagement to try and change behaviour. And I think your example there of BHP is a, um, a great example of how um, active ownership can influence change there. But I guess the other, the other point I was thinking as you were talking there is the increasing amount of building blocks to build a genuine diversified portfolio. Um, with ESG strategies, so the growth of fixed interest and bonds and all the other asset classes there. So, um, Tim, unfortunately, I think we need to draw this uh, conversation to an end. It's a, it's certainly a conversation I think we could go on for probably the next three or four hours there, but um, I think we've already stretched our timeliness on this podcast. But look, I seriously would like to thank you very much for joining us this morning on the, uh, the Net Wealth Investment Podcast Series. I think it's been a really interesting discussion and the points and your observations and insights to ESG the the development of ESG and particularly the client and growing client interest at both the retail and the institutional level I think is um is great to see that again capital markets and the the influence that we can have over the allocation of capital is starting to take into consideration not just a pure maximized return perspective back to the comment that I'd made in the introduction about traditional economics and um, and views on um, and views on uh, maximizing return so Tim thank you very much for your time this morning very much appreciated Oh, thank you very much. Pleasure. And to the listeners, thank you very much again for joining us on the Investment Podcast Series. I hope you found the conversation informative and a little bit educational there. I certainly learnt a lot from the discussion with uh, Tim there from Russell Investments there. Um, have a great day. Look after yourselves. And I look forward to you joining us on the next instalment of the podcast series. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. For more episodes and to subscribe to our series, visit our website, www.netwealth.com.au or visit the iTunes Store or Spotify. We hope you can tune into our next episode.